Hi there, and welcome to chapter 3.3 from Stevens' Introduction to Statistics, the Think and Do book. In the previous two sections of this chapter, we first discussed um, frequency distributions, also known as frequency tables, and basically that was a, a good way to organize large amounts of data by separating them into classes and counting up the frequencies and putting that into a table. And then histograms, section 3.2, described how we took that table and turned it into a graphic, you know, something you could see, a little easier to comprehend. And in this section, we're just going to go over a few other um, popular graphics, graphs from statistics. There's, there's lots more, but this just gives you, these are a few of the more popular ones. So I'm going to convert this to full screen mode for this purpose. Okay, so the first one we're going to start with is the stem or stem and leaf plot, right? It's done so because you have the stem counts and then the leaves. And so these represent um, the scores for the males in test 2 that we went over in 3.1 and 3.2. So there's a whole bunch of test scores. And this is actually a list of all the test scores. For example, this 8 right here represents a 48, right, because we have the 4 and the 8. This um, 6 right here represents a 66, because we have a 6 and a 6. This here is a 67, and then we have another 67 and another 67, so we actually have three 67s. And so you can get a, you can get a view of how many scores were in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. In fact, you, this is a list of all the scores. It's a really nice, quick, easy way to list out all the scores. And if you're careful about the way you insert your units here and give them the same amount of space, what you can see is if you turn your head sideways, you can actually get a little bit of a view of the histogram we had when we did this in the previous section. Right, turn your head sideways, there's sort of what the distribution looks like. Um, so it's very handy, very easy. Uh, you don't really, you know, I will put my scores on the board sometimes in this fashion uh, because it's easy to do by hand. If you have software, you probably use a histogram. A couple more, the Pareto chart and the pie chart. And I'm going to go first with the pie chart, right, because people are more familiar with this. And what that does, it takes qualitative data, quali qualitative categories, right, reasons for being late to work. That's qualitative data, right? You can't add these things, average them. There's the difference is that you can't rank them. Um, so we have this qualitative data, reasons for being late to work, and we put the frequencies in terms of a relative frequency and let that relative frequency take up the appropriate proportion of the area of the um, circle. In other words, if you look at traffic, right? Traffic took up 36% of the reasons for being late for work, right? And what that means is that this angle here is 36% of 360 degrees. Right. And then child care came in second with 25% of the reasons. Right. And then others, sometimes there's another category, that just took up 5%. Right. So it gives you a sort of a pleasant view of the way these things um, came out, with, uh, relatively speaking. If you wanted to put um, actual frequencies, sometimes people would put them here and be like, okay, well, 70 of the answers were here, and um, you know, 50 of the responses were childcare. You know, so you can actually, you don't necessarily have to put in the relative frequencies. Okay, so people are pretty comfortable with pie charts. They've seen a lot of them. Pareto charts, you've seen, probably seen them. You just didn't know the name. It's a less well-known name, Pareto chart. So what it does, it takes the same thing, same kind of stuff. Um, if you look down here in the x-axis, it's qualitative data, the same from the pie chart. And it gives the frequencies, right? So it's sort of a histogram for qualitative data, or um, it's also a bar graph version of, of the pie chart. Right? So, and the the things that there's a couple details to Pareto charts. For one thing, the frequencies have to go in descending order, right? You should be walking down the steps as you're going through the classes. Um, and over here on the left, 
those are the actual frequencies. Um, but and you could also put the relative frequencies over here instead if you wanted to. But a Pareto chart specifically, and you know, people alter them as they see fit. This would be, you know, 36 percent. Um, 25 percent would be down here. So you could put the frequent relative frequencies down here. But technically speaking, it's the actual frequencies. And then you get this little thing here. This represents the cumulative relative frequency. If you recall, we discussed that back in the previous section. And so what that means is that this 70 right here takes up, what, about 36%. And then when you go up to child care, right there, what that means is when you add the two together, you're at about 60%. So 60% of the responses were traffic or child care. And then when you get to weather, you're up here. And overslept here, emergency here. When you finally get to the other, you're at 100%. So it gives you a, a cumulative relative frequency, this little line graph with the dots for this qualitative data. So it's pretty slick. Um, you don't often see this quite as much. You, you, you'll often see a Pareto chart, but you won't always see the relative cumulative frequency part that corresponds to it. Uh, okay, so moving on to bar graphs. Um, and a bar graph is a generic term. And this generic term is um, describing just any graph that has a bar in it, really. Um, and there's one thing that should always be the case with bar graphs. Um, the bar lengths should be proportional to the values they represent. For example, if you look at the um, the top four states by population, they are California, Texas, New York, and Florida. If you look at this graph, this is good. All right, you can see that California is by far the biggest. Um, Texas coming in second, New York and Florida sort of tied for, for third and fourth. And the key thing here that makes this a good bar graph is that it starts at zero. All right. This number, whatever this is, say it's something like 37, this is 25. The ratio of those two numbers is the same thing as the ratio of these two heights of these bars. And unlike that, when you move over to this one, which is done poorly, and you should recognize immediately that something's up because this bottom number is not zero. So that's bad. And so what that does is this 37 here and this 25, if you look at this bar, and you look at this bar, the first one, the 37, is more than twice the size of the 25, and that just isn't right. You know, 37 is not more than twice 25. So it exaggerates the differences, right? The bar graphs are not proportional to the numbers they represent, and it tends to distort the view of the data, right? It makes California seem a lot bigger um, with respect to Texas and New York than it actually is. So, be careful. Bad. The bar graphs are not proportional. How can you tell if they're not proportional? Right down here. It needs to start at zero. So that's sort of the general story for any type of bar graph. Um, okay, scatter plot. And we'll get into these in great detail in chapter 10. But here, uh, the first one, we have temperature on the x-axis. Cricket chirps and chirps per minute on the y-axis. And um, so the, each one of these points is actually represents two numbers, a temperature and a, and a chirps per minute. Right, so that's, that's what this is. So each data point actually has two numbers associated with it. And so when you, get, when you tally up all the, these points for each temperature, there's a chirps per minute, and you plot them on a graph. Now, um, you get what's known as a scatter plot. And what you can see in this scatter plot, that's pretty obvious, is that as temperature increases, the chirps per minute gets higher. Which makes sense. It gets warmer, their little legs loosen up, and they can uh, rub them together more easily, and they chirp faster. Um, this is just one of my favorite um, scatter plots. And it was basically the grades, current grades of students and the mean family deaths per 100 students as reported by the students. So this is somewhat of a morbid topic, but it discloses something greater than just 
um, mortality issues. What it shows here is that if a student, say, um, is getting an A in the class, right, then the reported deaths per 100 students is very low, very close to zero. And that doesn't matter whether there's a, no test, midterm, or final. And if there's no test, it really doesn't matter that much whether they're getting an A, well, I'll circle the blue triangles, B, C, D, and F. So if there's no test coming up, you know, there doesn't seem to be any change in the uh, mean family deaths per 100 students. And that makes sense. But the, the funny thing is that if the student is getting, say, and we'll look at, say, midterm now. So we'll look at the red squares, right? The student's getting an A. There's a very low number of reported deaths. You get a B, it increases a little bit more. C, D, and F. Right? And so what that says is that if the worse the student is doing, you know, the greater the, the mean number of family deaths as reported by the students. And then that, that increase is even more exaggerated when you look at those students who are coming towards a final. And so it's suggesting that students are lying about um, family members dying. Or if you read it the other way around, um, students who are doing poorly come test time, their family members have a higher risk of death. And that's sort of what this article is down here that I mentioned. It's sort of a spoof on how dangerous it is to be related to a student who's not doing well. It's a good article, um, but this this um, particular scatter plot really tells the whole the whole story. The article sort of just goes into this satire about um, potential deaths in fa of family members related to students who aren't doing well in class. Um, okay, anyway, and a time series graph, and it's sort of like a scatter plot only. Down here, the x-axis has to be time, all right? And so, basically, you're watching the, the change of some variable as time progresses. And here, we're looking at the U.S. gross debt as a percentage of GDP. It's a sort of popular index in economics. And I categorized it by um, administration, Carter administration, Reagan, Bush 1, Clinton, Bush 2, Obama, right? And so... What you can see is that the U.S. gross debt as a percent of GDP increases. Well, let's see. Carter goes, it stays about flat, goes up, goes up, flat, drops a little. Um, Bush 2 going up. And then this is that big um, hit we took around 2007, 2008, um, where the economy really hit the tank. And um, you can see things are really increasing, right? And then... You know, to be seen. And and so this is actually good. This 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 graph over here on the left, this one, it's good because it starts at zero. Sorry, this covered it up. Most value is zero percent. If you look at this particular graph, right, it doesn't start at zero. It starts at 30%. And it represents the same data. What it does is just like when we did the bar graph where the bars were not proportional to the numbers they represent. It exaggerates these differences. Right? Differences seem bigger. Differences seem bigger. Just like before with the bar graphs. And that's because we didn't start at zero down here. So keep your eye open for that. It's not, you know, there's nothing unethical about it. I mean, it does, it allows you to see the differences more clearly. Um, but it does, it sort of distorts the big picture. So keep your eye open for that kind of thing. And again, if you want uh, some tips and demonstrations on how to do these, how to create these graphs with various technologies such as your TIs, um, SPSS, Excel, Minitab, um, and others, you can go to stevenstats.com. All right, so that pretty much wraps it up for this chapter. We'll do the summary worksheet and call it a day for Chapter 3. Bye now.